Welcome to the U.S. Naval War College Lecture of Opportunity. Who is joining us today is Lieutenant General Michael Groen. Lieutenant General Groen is the recently confirmed director of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. And as a member of the Jake team, he leads the transformation of the U.S. joint warfighting and deployment processes through the integration of artificial intelligence. Additionally to uh, coming to Jake, uh, previously he was at the National Security Agency and served as the Deputy Chief of Computer Network Operations, leading this premier computer network exploitation organization. He's also served the Chair of the Joint Chiefs. He has an interesting bio. I encourage you to go on that line and look at it at the Jake website. Uh, he does have several master's degrees, advanced degrees, but the most important degree that he has among all of his degrees is the U.S. Naval War College degree. And so, General Groy, we welcome you back to the Naval War College and uh, look forward to giving us some insights about Jake. Yeah, great. Thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Creeley. I, I, it really is great to be virtually back. I guess virtually gives me the advantage of not having to feel the January wind blowing through my uniform as I'm trying to get to class. So, uh, yeah. so there's a lot to be said for this virtual stuff. But, but uh, I, I do remember for for everybody. You know, th thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Um, I remember clearly. You know, once you pass the Christmas, New Year's holidays, uh, and suddenly you're looking. Now you can actually see graduation on the horizon. And so suddenly everything becomes a lot more real and you realize how much work you have to do uh, uh, before you're ready to leave uh, uh, Newport. So, so I wish you all the best. I know, uh, I know you're, you're getting danger close now. And so, uh, so I appreciate the time that you're, uh, that you're spending with us today. Okay, thank you. Well, let's get right on into some of the questions that uh, we have looked at and, and have thought about at the War College. Uh, a number of people have submitted uh, some questions and then we'll, later on, we will take questions from the uh, chat uh, for Q&A the, near the end. So with the basics of Jake, what should a War College student who's graduating in 2021 know about artificial intelligence? How important is this at this point in time? Yeah, a, a great question uh, to get us started here. And I, I think it's critical, obviously. I do, I do think, you know, there's, there's a magic mix of skill sets that's required in leadership in the military and in the Pentagon today. Um, it, it, it's fed by, um, I, was, I think, three, three things that, that, you know, all of us need to be experts in. And if we're not, then we have to study hard to get there. And that is, um, you know, the graduate education that you're getting at the Naval War College and the other service colleges um, that allows you to think, uh, you know, think uh, outside the lines, right, and figure out, you know, where are those lines and why are they there. The second, the second piece uh, is is warfighting understanding. I mean, you, especially, you know, as you, as you, you know, become an 05, become an 06, become an 07. I mean, you have to understand deeply how warfighting happens in the department, how we fight as as organizations, and how we fight to fight as an institution. And so if you take those two things and you add technical literacy to that, now you've got the mix that really is going to make somebody successful in 21st century uh, war fighting and, uh, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in this in starting, you know, starting now. Right. We, we struggle with this every day is this balance between we have tech literate people. We have great thinkers. We have war fighting experts. We need we need those skill sets uh, in, in, in one person. And, and I think, you know, just to, just to talk about like, okay, what, what does a you know, graduate in 2021 need to think about? Um, it, I, I, I would say, you know, first, the, the tempo of war fighting, the tempo of war fighting is in for dramatic acceleration. And, and that has a, it, has, it has a huge impact on the way we, not only the things that we do, the equipment we buy, that sort of thing, but how we, how we think about our operations. You know, I always think about, um, you know, uh, Yamamoto, you know, 1941, uh, I, I'm afraid we've only, you know, awakened a sleeping giant. And, and that was true. And over the course of years, the U.S. industrial capacity, you know, defeated, you know, dictators on multiple continents. But here's the thing. Today, 
a threat actor can have effects uh, almost instantaneously at, you know, at intercontinental ranges, at hypersonic speeds, um, you know, in multiple domains, you know, cyber attacks, uh, a space denial. I mean, all of these things are real artifacts of the modern warfighting age. And so to be able to respond in that age, you've, you know, industrial capacities are not going to be sufficient or uh, industrial capabilities. I mean, you have, to, you have to be thinking about how you can succeed in a digital environment. The good, the, so you know, artificial intelligence itself, uh, it's a general purpose technology. Um, its value is really measured in everything it touches, right? So it's hard to talk about artificial intelligence about talking about the applications of artificial intelligence. And so you have to understand the applications of, of, of artificial, artificial intelligence and how, it, how it's transformed by uh, commercial technology. Um, AI is largely about predictions. Uh, and decision making, certainly in the state of the art today, and so it takes you know it takes what you know from past experience and from structured problem and help you understand what's likely to come next. Right, the prediction machines is kind of what you know what what artificial intelligence is a a nomiker that uh, that's labeled on artificial intelligence. Here's what I will tell all of all of you: um, Look, AI is not something that will happen in the future. AI exists today. It exists in the world that we live in. You know, every you know when you when you leave the office, uh, you know, or you leave the Pentagon and you pick up your cell phone, you are you are immersed in a modern digital environment that runs at 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 great speed because it's enabled by artificial intelligence. But then on the flip side, when you turn your phone off and walk into the Pentagon or walk into the SCIF or walk into your CP. Suddenly, you're back in the industrial age, right? And and so, you know, artificial intelligence has integrated defense to a much lesser degree than um, than than you know than than it has the rest of our lives, right? And that that's 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 partly because of uh, what I would call a tech inversion, right? So, you know, historically, the Department of Defense would create capabilities, and that that technology would trickle out into the commercial environment. Today, we have an inversion of that, right? Where we have very advanced digital technology that's driving our social and commercial environments, yet we haven't, that hasn't trickled in to the Department of Defense. It's not a lack of technology that's our problem, you know, obviously, because it exists everywhere else. It's our, our problem is, 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 I think, two things, imagination and implementation. And so when you get back out to the fleet, you get back out to wherever you're going, um, looking at problems through a, a technically a technologically informed lens, and and a warfighting lens is going to be the difference maker for uh, for your units, your services. Okay, yeah, I would think that uh, I've heard several people talk about the issues of imagination, and that is expanding people's capacity of thinking, and through education, that is is going to to help with that. And implementation is obviously dealing with the bureaucracy. Uh, meetings with the DIB uh, uh, demonstrated that and how do you move things within the bureaucratic government uh, given the speed of uh, artificial intelligence. Now, recently you've spoken, uh, I read in Defense One about transformation. So what do you mean by transformation? How, what is the means of transforming the Department of Defense and the impact of uh, future military operations and artificial intelligence? Yeah, so, so great question. Because the distinction, you know, why, why would we call this a transformation? I, I think of it in the same way I think about the transformation to industrial age warfare, where it really came to a head in World War I. Right. So, so you know, if, if you like me were binge watching, you know, uh, uh, Netflix, World War I documentaries, you know, uh, uh, during, during the, the height of the COVID uh, months, you know, if, if you saw Lancers riding into battle against machine guns, massed artillery fire, barbed wire, chemical agents, um, what, what, how, how could that be, right? How could it be that somebody who lived or, or a, a force or a commander who lived in the industrial age was very familiar with all the artifacts of the technology, um, still think that lancers had a place on the battlefield, literally men with wooden sticks with iron spikes on the end. 
riding into machine guns, right? This is where the, the, the realities of industrial age warfare, all of the industrial age artifacts that these people were very familiar with in their daily lives suddenly became magnified into a, a complete transformation of warfare into something that you know, honestly, we still, you know, we still think a lot the same way today. So now think about, the, now think about where we are today. Think about all of the information age artifacts that we're surrounded with, every component of our life. Hundreds of times a day, we touch an artificial intelligence agent. We just don't necessarily realize it. So how do you, you, you know, how do you uh, not just field a piece of equipment or field an AI into the Department of Defense, but how do you transform the Department of Defense, right? So, and I, and I think a transformation in kind of three broad areas. One is war fighting. So clearly our war fighting still industrial de derived in places we've incorporated the artifacts of the industrial or the information age, but we haven't yet achieved information age warfare. So, so war fighting is, is, is by far our number one priority, but there are two other broad enterprises that I think we should talk about. One is the, uh, the support enterprises. So this is things like the, um, you know, the defense logistics agency and the logistics enterprise the Defense Intelligence Agency and the Intelligence Enterprise, or the Health Agency, or pick, pick your favorite agency or activity in the department. There are 28 of them, I believe, in addition to the services. So, so to, to really change, and then, and then the third category is, is, is business practices, right? So, so, so the, the Department of Defense, uh, five services, you know, 28 agencies, uh, about 3 million people, about $700 billion a year, if there's one place on this planet that needs to be transformed using artificial intelligence from everything from bringing fires quickly to bear on a target to, uh, you know, matching unmatched receipt transactions in the comptroller's office and everything in between requires broad transformation. This is not something we're going to poke at and call it done. It can't, it can't be that way. The entire world has transformed around us yeah. and we're behind the power curve. So when I talk about transformation, that's what I'm talking about. We have, and, and specifically, I think the, 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 the officers in the, in, in the in war colleges today, you have a generational opportunity here to transform the department in ways it's never been done before. And uh, I think digital modernization and being, um, you know, being the, 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 the individual, the leader who can combine military expertise, warfighting expertise, and technical familiarity and technical skills is really going to be a valuable, a valuable proposition going forward from, the, from this point. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I know last year, UD uh, came out with the ethics principles guidelines. Uh, I worked with the Defense Innovation Board on that um, as well. Uh, we made some input. And in respect to ethics and AI, is the intention to eventually have uh, AI capable moral agency, including moral deliberation, acting autonomously on those deliberations, being able to evaluate and defend their actions in moral terms to other moral agents and being held responsible accordingly? Yeah, import, important question. Um, so moral agency, so, um, we're, we are certainly nowhere near moral agency. You know, we're not, we're not even, we can't even see it from where we are. So, so it is a question that we have to con continue to consider. I, I, honestly, uh, you know, from where I sit, I don't know that we would ever go there, right? By, by definition, this requires, you know, the ability, I guess, not only to, you know, understand what's legal and what's illegal, but what's right and what's wrong. And, and we don't even allow human agency in that space in many, in many areas. I mean, this is why we have commanders, for example, and why, you know, the example of being a commander is so important is because you are the person with moral agency over your unit. You are the person with moral agency over the technology that you use. And so I, 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 I cannot foresee a day when we do that. And that's not to say that, you know, uh, this this uh, this technology moves fast, and uh, uh, you know, as it integrates across the you know the rest of our lives, maybe maybe people will become more comfortable with it. Um, I it, it, to me, it's really um, it, it's 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 really a that's a question of philosophy. Um, but th but that doesn't mean that we that doesn't mean that we 
can, you know, oh, good, thank God, we don't have to worry about that anymore. No, no, actually, the integration of artificial intelligence under human moral agency brings with it a plethora of, of moral and ethical arguments that we have to think through, right? So, you know, probably closer to the closer to the uh, to the to the the barn here is, um, you know, what kind of tasks can we delegate to an AI system? True. What kind of decisions are we willing to make from an AI recommender? Um, so, you know, the the preponderance, the vast preponderance of the um, use cases for artificial intelligence in the department today are decision support. Right. And so making decisions faster, making decisions data driven. Um, and then the next biggest tranche is um, man machine teaming. So when you think like where the departments focus and when I say the department, all the services, uh, the agencies that have their own AI efforts, the Jake, of course, others, um, you, you know, our, our focus right now is enabling humans to make better decisions and make them faster. So this is things like, you know, how do you do integrated and uh, integrated fires, command and control and intelligence so that you can you can understand what's going on around you. You can make sense of it quickly and make good decisions and then execute. Right. So that's that's kind of, you know, that more that moral agency remains clearly with the commander in that case. And so we're uh, that's that, that's where most of our work is now. Some of the technical work, uh, you know, with things like, uh, you know, autonomous drones and swarms and stuff like that. Uh, loyal wingman kind of concepts. Most of those are still conceptual, but we're doing a lot of good work to figure out, okay, how do, how do people and machines now operate together as a team much, much more effectively? And, and, and we're, you know, obviously we're all very comfortable with um, machines with some degree of autonomy currently, you know, uh, uh, controlled under human judgment, right? So uh, especially when the use of forces is, 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 is uh, contemplated. You know, our cruise missiles, our uh, our laser guided bombs, you know, precision guided munitions, uh, um, you know, close in weapon systems on a ship, uh, uh, you know, THAAD, you know, air defense capabilities. So many of these have automated components, but they still remain under uh, a human moral agency. Yeah. Well, that's important. And that's exactly what we do with the uh, Ethics and Emerging Military Technology graduate program at the War College is to take the philosophy of, of technology, the philosophy of ethics, and apply it to technology. And our students wrestle with these hard questions that are not easy. And so, you know, yeah. certainly make it a contribution uh, in that area. And looking a, a little bit of ahead, um, do you intend to participate in the discussions with other top AI experts and gain collaboration with think tanks to mitigate the high stakes risk associated with AI? Yeah, so, so um, I, I guess first I would say that, I mean, the Jake is not a policy shop. So we are, we are an implementation organization. And so this is, this is, a, this is a distinction that we, you know, that we, we try to make uh, uh, across the department because we have great partnerships with organizations like DARPA, with the research and engineering uh, organizations in the, you know, in, in the service labs, so there's a lot of our R&D enterprises that are, that are looking carefully at artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence applications. Our niche is to the right of that, right? So we are taking, we are transitioning things from the research and development environment and turning them into real implemented capabilities. So um, instead of think tanks, we have do tanks, right? So, so we are focused on getting things accomplished. So, uh, but, but again, that, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't excuse us from the ethical, the, the, the set of ethical questions. I mean, your ethical radar has got to be on um, all the time, and especially because of the high consequence missions that the Department of Defense operates that nobody else does, right? So life and death decisions at scale even um, are, are, are things that every military officer has got to take very closely to heart and have a really sound moral sense to think about this. Um, when, one thing that does strike me, you know, when, when, uh, you know, some of the, some of the think tank publications, of course we, you know, we read them and we, we take a look at that and, you know, we use that to kind of, you know, adjust our moral compass, but, uh, but I, you know, a lot, there's a lot of coulds there, you know what I mean? It's, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of hype in that space. So I think, you know, we've gone through periods where the, the tech, the, the hype was associated with the technology and what it could accomplish. I think that there's a lot of hype associated with, 
oh my God, you know, this, this kind of thing could happen. And um, I, when, I, when I read that kind of stuff, I think, I think of a couple different things. Uh, like I said before, no officer is off the hook for having a strong moral and ethical foundation, especially when it applies to the use of technology. But there are things, there are moral imperatives, there are technical or legal imperatives like the law of armed conflict. And then I, I would say there are comparatives. And when I say comparatives, I think in a lot of cases, when we talk about, you know, what could happen or what, you know, what dangers could be present, we always have to compare it to what dangers do we, do we, do we take to, that do we have today, right? So, so you know, things like uh, collateral damage assessment. So, you know, we do collateral damage assessment today with humans, um, and, you know, and it's part of our targeting process. And I'm actually, so I'm, I'm a recovering targeteer. I, you know, I, I, uh, uh, I'm really proud of the way the U.S. military does this, right? We pay really close attention. We do everything we can to minimize the loss of life, sometimes going to just extraordinary lengths. It's, 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 it's really motivating to be part of an institution with that kind of moral grounding. So, um, but machines can do collateral damage estimation much better than humans can, right? We've built algorithms for, you know, doing like, like typhoon damage assessment, right? So one of the first things if you're going to do typhoon relief is you want to, you want to understand this block of homes, should we just bulldoze them or can they be repaired? We've got AI tools now that we've developed to help uh, uh, responders do that kind of stuff. And it takes the place of lots of people with clipboards walking down the, walking down wet streets. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of stuff that, that we can put into place. So, so let's go back to the moral questions about targeting and collateral damage assessment. Well, if machines can do that much better than humans can, at what point is it immoral to have humans doing that and moral to have a machine do that? You know what I mean? So you get into these these sort of twisted, the, the, you know, these, these, these moral and ethical boundaries, they twist on you. And you have to think through like, okay, um, you know, here's another one, you know, dirt, dirty and dangerous, right? So we, you know, today we put young men and women, you know, uh, against steel, right? We'll, we'll, you know, we're still Russian, uh, you know, squad leaders and squads of Marines, you know, up against entrenched enemies. Um, at what point does that become immoral? At, at what point does it become more moral to have an autonomous uh, a weapon system or, you know, a, a remote control weapon system to actually take the line of fire. At what point do you make the decision that, yeah, you know what, it's, it's better for me to not put humans into that space at all. And you, and you know, some of these arguments, you know, you, you, things like, uh, you know, well, could unmanned platforms, you know, it, uh, you know, in the Pacific, you know, create strategic, uh, you know, strategic escalation for perhaps. And you have to ask yourself from a moral agency question, is it more acceptable to have a strategic escalation risk or is it more or is it more acceptable to have humans in the line of fire on a ship in the South China Sea, for example, under the range of, you know, a, a, a host, a forest of DF-21s? So, so those are the kinds of things that our officers have got to be able to, to, to reconcile. And so um, I, 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 I would just add this, you know, so, so today – the real existential moral agency questions are not things that most of us are going to deal with, but there are real moral and ethical questions that still have to be decided. You know, things like when you, now when you start talking about, um, you know, real applications of AI in the department today, I mean, you, you know, there's always, um, you know, when you're, when you're building an AI algorithm, for example, uh, especially one that's forward deployed. Well, you have to worry about latency, right? Because of your bandwidth limitations, and so um, uh, there's a there's generally a trade off, an engineering trade off between latency and ac accuracy, right? So you the the more bandwidth you have, the more time your model has to think about a problem, the better solution it's going to give you. Right now, somebody has to make that decision on the technical scale. Do I do I design my algorithm so it can make decisions quickly in a, in a low latency environment? Or do I design my AI so that it can take all the time it wants, but it gives me a better answer? That's a moral question that if, if military leaders don't engage on that sort of question, then it's up to an engineer somewhere. And I love our engineers. They're great Americans. Uh, but you know what? Um, 
I don't know that I'm comfortable leaving a, a, you know, a decision with moral impact on the engineering team. You know what I mean? So that's the kind of moral questions that, uh, that, uh, that our folks have to think about, right? So, you know, here's another one, you, you know, so training data. So we train our machine learning algorithms on training data. Well, if I train a machine learning algorithm on data that I collected in the Middle East, say, and now I'm going to use that algorithm in the Pacific, or in Europe or something like that. Now, okay, am I, you know, I, I don't know what that performance is gonna look like necessarily. I don't know if there will be second or third order effects from that machine to its decision-making. So, you know, the moral requirement to ensure the responsible application of your AIs into the, you know, into the situations that they're being exposed that falls on commanders, that falls on military leaders who are, who are part of this decision-making process. Yeah, ethics is becoming more and more prominent in uh, making the decisions from the operator in the enlisted level all the way to the four stars and even the secretaries uh, in the Pentagon. Uh, the next question I want to ask you is, uh, partnerships with tech and corporate sector are obviously critical to ensuring DOD can benefit from artificial intelligence. What are the challenges that private sector partners cite to working with DOD? And I've heard some of these in working with some of the private sector and talking with them and uh, about these challenges. Yeah, I, th I think there was, uh, you know, there was uh, maybe some tension, you know, some years ago, honestly, today, um, I, I, I don't see it right today. It's not an issue for us. Um, AI vendors are beating down our doors to want to work with the department of defense. And, uh, there's, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of different reasons for that. I think, uh, one is that, uh, um, you know, the, the, uh, small aggressive innovative companies, I mean, the AI space is a really competitive space now, right? So almost every company is an AI company in one way, shape or form. I mean, there's this, there's this vertical mar mar uh, market segmentation where, where what, what used to be broad AI companies have now established niches, right? And so they're, you know, the, 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 the AI market is so segmented. You have, you have specialized companies in all these different areas. And so that makes it a really competitive environment. And so um, I think that might be an aspect. Um, there are, um, you know, we've seen the emergence of specifically defense-oriented AI companies so there's there are there are some AI companies that have particular you know have been formed some very successful ones and really great to work with um, uh, you know specifically to work on defense problems because they're driven by the the value the value challenge right so there are there are many great Americans who don't serve serve in uniform but yet who want to be part of defending you know, defending America right and so so that patriotism and that moral fiber is there in the tech industry, just as, just like it's, uh, it is anywhere else. We have, um, you know, we have sound relationships. We have relationships with all of the major vendors, you know, all of the major vendors that you, that, you know, that, that you would come off the top of your tongue. Um, so, so we, you know, we've, we've, we've got those vendors uh, on board. So we've got relationships across the industry. So what we're, you know, what, what our focus in, is now in that space, you know, we're trying to get more, small innovative companies into the into the Department of Defense business, right? And and the depend the sort of the defense industrial complex is not really designed for small companies. It's designed for major defense contractors. And so we um, you know we use our major defense contractors as primes. We help them bring in so you know uh, small innovative subs uh, or subcontractors. And then we also uh, have uh, in this latest um, uh, uh, appropriations bill uh, in, in the NDAA, we are authorized uh, acquisition authority within the JIG. So now we can reach directly to um, some of those small innovative companies and create mechanisms that makes them easier for them to work with the Department of Defense. So we're, um, um, I, I, think, I think we've got a, a good relationship with the tech industry. Um, we've got a growing, you know, increasing, uh, you know, increasing, um, set of capabilities that we can access, you know, for, from the major inventors, you know, everything from, you know, uh, you know, just commercial cloud computing all the way to algorithm development. And I think, I think one of the features of that for our relationship with the industry is you can kind of pick 
you know, if you're a company, you can kind of pick how close to the fire you want to be, right? So, you know, it's everything from, you know, running a commercial cloud environment, you know, like some of our big companies are, um, and then, you know, having defense businesses operate on the commercial cloud. Well, that's that's fairly benign, right? So you're, you know, you're sitting next to, um, you know, a, a commercial entity on the cloud. So, um, so, so all the way to no kidding now is helping, uh, you know, to automate or provide, you know, a, 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 some degree of autonomy into a weapon system and so and everything in between. And so I think that there's a broad range where um, uh, uh, AI companies can now kind of pick where they want to be on that spectrum. We do a lot of humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, for example. So most companies are very, you know, very comfortable working with the Department of Defense on that kind of activity. So I generally, I mean, just to sum it up, I think, I think we're, I, I think we have a good relationship with the tech industry now. That's good. And, and getting that uh, acquisition authority is quite important. Uh, gives you a lot more flexibility uh, to respond to the immediate needs uh, there. Uh, the next question is, with the push to deepen systems integration to enhance battle space and awareness uh, in operational units, describe the role AI will play in cybersecurity protect decision maker sensor shooter network. Yeah, so so great question, and uh, uh, you know I think I think the recent uh, you know the recent recent expose of uh, you know foreign foreign intelligence services you know getting into uh, into our a lot of the networks is a is you know, should be a wake up call to all of us um, you, you know in it, it and AI is certainly not immune from from that kind of that that kind of interference. I mean, there's um, uh, I, I I guess how I like to think of it, you know, AI can be a really critical component of cybersecurity. That is, you know, really there's no better machine to, to watch the activity on the net than a machine, right? Uh, you know, humans can do it, but, uh, but machines can, can actually do that much better, whether you're talking about detecting patterns in data or what, you know, whatever, whatever, that, whatever that is. That um, uh, AI can play a key role in cybersecurity. But the flip side of that is cybersecurity has to play a key role in artificial intelligence. Because uh, your, your data and the risk of corruption of your data, your algorithms, the risk of corruption of your algorithms, the risk of adversarial AI that is specifically trying to defeat your, your artificial intelligence capability. So like, like any emerging tech environment, you know, you see this sort of race between capability and counter capability and counter capa- counter counter capability. And, and you know, the, and so the, as the, uh, you know, as the uh, threats mature and manifest, you see the tech industry mature and manifest as well. And so we, uh, we in the Jake, for example, have a very well, you know, well connected uh, uh, research, research arm that, that, that really watches the, the, especially the academic research and then the, and then the commercial research uh, where, where we can have access to it um, to really keep an eye on, to make sure that we are aware of and following the 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 maturity and the emergence of risk in our space, and then our ability to to defend against that. So you know we've you know we've taken that sort of sensitivity, and and created very secure environments for our uh, you know our um, our our uh, AI data you know our training data, uh, and our and our algorithms. And so in the department, you know one of the things that you know our officers will have to kind of balance is. Uh, you know, you, you want to be able to share, you know, data quickly among services, for example, or algorithms among services or other, you know, other components so that, you know, you can, you can, you can, you can take you know, leverage this technology that already exists. Yet, every time you share, you expose new risks. And so building the right kind of enclaves, building the right kind of, uh, you know, containerization so that you can have trusted code that can move from one service to another service or from one place in the department to another um, is it takes a lot of our time now to try, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about, okay, how do we secure this AI enterprise? Okay. I know that Jake has engaged with NATO and, um, and now you're facilitating a forum called the AI Partnership for Defense with a host of partner nations. Can you discuss how the Jake is coordinating with allies on various AI initiatives? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So, so I think I think there's a there's a there's a couple of points here. One one I think I would uh, start with, uh, you know, that 
the, the U.S. has been at the forefront. And again, I'm, I'm very proud of this. I mean, you, you know, all of us are, you know, who, who wear a uniform or serve, serve our department. Um, you know, the, the, the U.S. Department of Defense has been forward leaning in establishing ethical baselines. Mm-hmm. So we, you know, we've done it with autonomy, for example, in the DOD uh, 3000.09, right? And so I'm sure that's a topic of discussion. Um, but, but so we have, you know, we laid down a set of principles for the use of autonomy and what we're willing to do and what we're not willing to do as a military. And that's a powerful statement. We've done the yeah. same sort of thing with, uh, with AI ethical principles. And so, so the DOD, you know, the US DOD was, was, a, was a leader in actually, okay, publishing a, a set of principles that, that would guide our development of our AI. And it stands in marked contrast to what we observe for AI development in some of our threat nations, you know, clearly. Um, so, so that's actually a very strong attraction for uh, countries who think the same way we do. And so we, we uh, you know, we did some work here, General Shanahan, my predecessor did some work with NATO, uh, you know, a year or so ago. And, uh, you know, and, and, they, and they actually discovered that there was, we actually, you know, there was a, there was a 13 nations, including the United States, who kind of put their heads together and said, you know what, we actually want to think together and work together on this. And so we've, we've, we've established the AI Partnership for Defense, those 13 nations. Um, it's, uh, we, we have, matter of fact, we're, we have our next summit, uh, I think in two weeks, two or three weeks. So, um, so we have all of those nations coming together virtually. And, uh, and it's not, um, you know, this is not just for us to, to, you know, kind of throw ethical principles at each other. We actually now are thinking through the, the elements of, of, uh, of development of, a, of an AI capability. So when we talk in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about data strategies and data protection. We're going to talk about algorithm protection and algorithm testing and evaluation. And so some of these things that have ethical implications, you know, applied ethical implications into uh, developing technology they want to be right where we are and we want to be right where they are, quite frankly. So, so in many cases, uh, there are very mature models of AI development and integration in our partners, uh, just like, just like we have here. And so, um, so we want to take advantage of that. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to uh, our session here in a couple of weeks. And, uh, and we, we are, we meet about quarterly. So this is not kind of the old school, you know, uh, a conference where, you know, you get, you get people into the United States and the Americans talk for a day and then it's done. Like, that's not what this is, right? This is a real partnership. We're working together. We're learning from them. They're learning from us and we're sharing across, the, across that community. So I'm, I'm really excited about it, if you can tell, because I, I, I think it's a really powerful message and it gives us strength, right? It, 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 it helps make our efforts stronger. It does create some awful lot of synergy in the relationships across the uh, different cultures and, and regulations and rules. Over the next five years, what will be some noticeable impacts of DOD's employment of AI? How will we know your time as director was successful? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. yeah I, guess, in there. I guess they say if the band's playing when you come into office and the band's playing when you leave from office, then uh, you know, then you did pretty well. So, but uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I am such, I, such a believer in the necessity for transformation in the department, right? So I think anything that we do has to be measured against the transformational goal. And so, um, I, I mean, for me, you know, so there's, you know, right now, uh, you know, each of the services has an AI development effort. Some of them are very mature. Uh, some of the defense agencies have AI developments in different levels of maturity as well. There are many areas in the department where there's no AI at all and there needs to be. And so, um, you know, when we look at that environment as a jig, um, and we, and we, and we think through like, okay, what, what does broad transformation look like? How do we really get the department to change? Um, our, our, you know, our focus has become here in the last couple of months, really focusing on broad enablement, right? So we want to enable people who are on the cusp of using AI. We want to help them, you know, make that leap. People who have AI already, but haven't, you know, uh, implemented it at scale. We want to help them implement that at scale. And so the Jake is, is its primary function is, is enablement, right? We want to make other people successful. And so, so if we can make other people successful to the degree that we start to have recognizable scale across the department, 
then I will be very happy, right? And 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 because that gives us a baseline to build from. Um, the the other thing, um, uh, you know, one of the tools that we're building to enable that broad enablement is uh, something called the Joint Common Foundation. So here we're working with multiple parties. We're working closely with the Air Force. We're working closely with the uh, the Department's Chief Data Officer with. Uh, the, the, the Secretary of Defense office that uses uh, a, a system called Advana that, that, uh, um, that is, gives, gives data-driven decision-making or data-driven data uh, you know, briefings, for example. Uh, you, you know, just, just a note, you know, the, Depart- the, the Secretary's office or the Depth Secretary's office is in a really good place here. Uh, they don't use PowerPoints in their briefings. They use live data. So if you, if you want to brief something and you want to show your numbers, you show your numbers, right? You don't show the PowerPoint presentation of your numbers. You show the numbers that are there every day. And this, you know, this creates an environment of um, not just, you know, episodic, hey, let me go run a survey or, or ask a question, but constant knowledge, right? Like we're, we're, we're continuously, if you need to access the data, it's there for you. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of environment that we're trying to build across the department. So if we can get a joint common foundation that enables AI development, that can securely store data, that can securely store algorithms and help, you know, uh, contains the tools that people can use to develop algorithms, then, uh, then that will be another uh, uh, really, you know, a great success here for the Jake in, 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 the, in a few years. The, the third thing I would say, and, and, and this is important, um, you know, the, the Department of Defense is fantastic for its, uh, and, and it's known for its segmentation and its stovepiping, right? Given a challenge, every service will go do their own thing. Every agency will go do their own thing. Um, sometimes individuals within services do their own things, and so um, that's okay in industrial in an industrial age kind of environment where you're building technology yeah, that might drive you know one particular weapon system or something like that. When you're trying to stitch together an integrated warfighting capability across all the services and all the domains. Um, uh, that stovepiping is not acceptable, right? It it cannot work, and so um, uh, to to you know to move beyond stovepiping, you have to have a degree of governance. And I'm not talking about uh, governance, you know, that's the dead hand of governance that slows everything down. But I'm talking about creating capabilities that are so good, so virtuous that everybody wants to be part of them. Sure. We're, that's that's the direction we're taking, right? So we're trying to build really solid enterprise level capabilities that that you know any ai owner would be foolish to turn their back on right and so if we can collectively working with the services working with the agencies um pull together uh you know a, a, an integrated capability then i think we will really have something to be proud of and then we will start to see real transformation right i know a year ago um in April, when three and a half ga- million gallons of milk um, was being poured down the drain, um, produce was being plowed under, and uh, uh, livestock protein meats being euthanized because the farmers had no place to put it. Yet at the same time, there were uh, people in lines who were hungry looking for food. At that time, I called my good friend who was on this um, Zoom, uh, Dr. Molly John, the John Research Group, former uh, Deputy Secretary of Agriculture, is what can we do about this? And the first person we called, a group we called, was Jake to help uh, in uh, food insecurity, national security, and mitigating the waste and redirect that. And of course, certainly you have Project Salus, the Roman goddess of safety and well-being. Um, In what ways was AI used to mitigate uh, the disruption in the supply chain and the food distribution and uh, COVID-19. And y'all have to, with, have to set up the uh, Food Source USA, but it's a bigger problem than just that. Yeah, ex- ex- exactly. So, so Salus um, came about uh, in support of Northcom. So, you know, Northcom has the uh, you know, domestic, you know, uh, disaster response uh, 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 responsibility. Um, it's always, it's always good, you know, if, for, for the students, you have a couple months left. Um, get to know all of your the pantheon of Greek and Roman gods because you'll see all of those names, you know. In the uh, so so you you know it's it's an opsec issue perhaps, but uh, 
but but Salus was a great opportunity for us. Uh, you know, uh, this was uh, I, th- I think really in the in the you know when we had several hurricanes, you know, in succession, um, and then we had the COVID uh, the, the the COVID crisis on top of that. Um, the Northcom had some real challenges planning for okay, how do you track? Um, you know, what mechanisms do we use to track where potential shortages are? And mm-hmm. and if you can track demand then you can track, then you can estimate potential, you know, and you can track supply. Well, then you can estimate future shortages, for example. So, so in that environment, you know, we developed a number of, of algorithms uh, working with Northcom and others, um, you know, things, you know, things like uh, being able to, you know, do to forecast, you know, demand on critical food supplies, for example, or, uh, you know, uh, other, other release supplies, medical supplies, PPE, that sort of thing. Um, you know, at the same time, we were working on, uh, you know, uh, algorithms to, to help the, the California uh, firefighters, right, to, to, to fight wildfires. So, you know, th- that one is just a, it's just a fantastic example to me because it's so easy, right? And, it just, and it's just a great example, uh, you know, of imagination. So, so uh, you know, the way firefighters have dealt with, you know, massive wildfires uh, is, you know, at the end of the day, all of the command posts get together and the chiefs get together and they, 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 you know, they look at a map uh, and they'll, they'll draw a line. And when I say draw a line, I mean, literally some dude is looking at a, at a picture of a fire and then trying to figure out where that is on the map. And then they reproduce that map. And then they quickly rush that out to all of the other, you know, the fire planners and the commanders so that, you know, that, that the force can, you know, can, can continue to fight the fire. Why in the world would we do it like that, right? Why don't we use imagery to, to automatically map the fire line, make that data available through an app that a firefighter can have on his or her tablet, right? Absolutely. And so that's what we did, right? So, so, you know, we worked with the National Guard to do, uh, you know, to do some overhead sensing and to be able to, to image fires and then auto- autonomously then with an AI identify where the fire line is and give it a true georeference and then make that data available for firefighters. It's, you know, it's not magic. And this is what I say, you know, the, the, the challenge to into implementation of AI in the department is largely due to imagination, right? We have to imagine the use of these technologies in all of our problems. It's easy, it's easy to go from firefighting to warfighting, right? You can see the parallels. And you can, see, and it's easy to go from the distribution of COVID supplies to the distribution of logistics on a, you know, on a theater battlefield, for example. And so, um, you know, there's there's so much goodness, and a lot of people, um, honestly, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a lot of focus from uh, from outside on warfighting AI. Hey, you need to build, you know, um, um, swarming UASs and that sort of thing. All of that's really important, but I, I think, you know, for, for everybody who's listening, look, whatever your warfighting function is, whatever your process is, AI can do enormous things, right? You know, if it's, if you're a comptroller, we still have people looking at spreadsheets, like physical spreadsheets and looking for dollar signs, you know, match, trying to match this spreadsheet with that spreadsheet. No company in the United States does that, right? Of you know, of any scale, anyway. And so, why, why, why is that okay in the Department of Defense? It's not, right? And so, so in all of these warfighting areas, the opportunity to to just to take a white, you know, whiteboard and just think through um, uh, how AI might, uh, you know, I, I, how AI might facilitate your warfighting function, whatever it is. We we've started doing these actually as a precursor to doing like AI readiness evaluations. So we, we started, started doing um, imagination sessions, right? Where we'll take, a, we'll take a, a service or a component or a particular uh, warfighting function and we'll sit down with a blank sheet of paper and say, okay, let's, let's talk through from garrison to deployment to employment in a combat environment, to integrating support from whatever other warfighting functions, to you know, to, to you know, to, to win the battle and coming home, and we're and we're asking folks to think through like their processes, and so that you can actually map your processes. Right? AI starts with commanders and leaders who are who can think through their processes and know that hey, I could make this process much better. I could make a much better decision if I knew X, 
right? So if you, if you can if you can map your process to the degree that you can say, I would make a better decision if I if I knew X, holy cow. Now all you have to do is go get X, right? And X is usually readily available or you can make it readily available. You can make it readily available through an app. You can make it in a broadcast that goes into a command and control system. I mean, there's all of these technologies that are there. I, I would just encourage everybody, you know, when you go back to the fleet, um, you, you, should, you should look at all your problems and you should look at all the things that you do and you should say, you know what? I wonder how Amazon would do that. I wonder how Uber would do that. I wonder how pick your, pick your AI company, pick your uh, successful commercial environment. How would they do that? Yeah. And that is the key to opening the door to, oh, I see how we should do this process. We should do it like this, right? If you do that, you will be driving transformation in the department. The next question is um, AI education and training. Um, and I'd like to emphasize the whole education aspect. Too much of our training is uh, click the button and move on. Uh, how do we get into a much deeper, richer AI education and ethics education in uh, DOD, and how is that going to be implemented? Because I, I think it is absolutely critical that we move in that direction with full force, plenty of funding. Yes, I, I agree. And I, I would ask you to tell Congress the same thing. So, so, I, um, so we, we've, we've gotten a start here on, uh, on the AI education challenge. And, uh, you know, as we kind of dipped our toes in the water here, uh, you know, some months ago, uh, you know, we find the same the same challenges across the digital workforce writ large, right? Because our networks folks need you know need advanced technology grads, and so you know, all, so there's lots of people. We have a thing called the, the Defense Digital Service. I don't know many, many of you may have heard about it. You know, where we actually have um, you know uh, 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 some kind of uh, 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 IT troubleshooters, if you will. They're, they're more than just IT. They can actually come in and and look at how you're addressing a technological problem and then just give you some help with, hey, you know what, you, you might want to leverage this technology instead of that one, for example. So, so there's a lots of these little disparate elements across the department. And so um, we're, tr we're, um, we're trying to build an AI uh, education pipeline specifically. And so we have a, we have a strategy for that that, that, uh, that we're starting to execute. Um, but importantly, I just say this on the front end. So we're but we recognize that it's not just about like the Jake and producing an AI training course, if you will, right? It has to be more than that, as you impl I, I imply from your words. So, so we're working with, you know, uh, programs and resources, for example, in the department. So, you know, OSD has, an, has a department that whose job it is, is to do schoolhouses and education pipelines and training. Every service has a has a has their own approach to technical uh, you know for technical education and technical training and so what we want to do is work together we have a executive steering group you know for for AI in the department here we use that that ESG to figure out what's best practice and what makes sense for for training and education for AI you know and the and the solution set ranges from you know making some online courses available to you know uh, integrating, uh, you know, integrating it into the service academies to, uh, you know, creating a separate academy for, you know, for tech skills or something like that. So, I mean, there's a wide range of things that, that get put on the table. Sure. We've approached that with a, uh, with a, with our education pilot. So we recognize that in the, you know, in the AI space, there are a lot of different roles with respect to AI. So some people build AIs, some people, uh, you know, use AIs. Others lead organizations that do either one of those things. Some of them, you know, some people play a, a very technical role. Some some play a, a policy a policy and strategy role. So um, we're we're building a customized uh, uh, pilot program for each one of these archetypes. And so uh, as those, and, and we just did our first one uh, here a few months ago. Uh, and and what we did what we did was because I I I I I like the, in your question, you know the 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 idea of you know well i you know i clicked through a bunch of buttons and so now i'm trained right so what we did what we did with our ai with our drive ai pilot we uh we we linked together first of all we did link together uh several courses you know from from Casera, uh, coursera and udemy and a couple of these other uh you know online training venues that that we could you know that we could make available to a cadre of students and then we and then so we took those 
uh, those courses, and then we interspersed them with in-person training from, from expertise that we either have in the Jake or we could bring into the Jake to, uh, to give a specific training course, you know, just to talk about how this type of algorithm works or to talk about adversarial AI or talk about uh, data standards and that sort of thing. And then, and then at the end though, uh, you'll like this. Um, so we, um, you know, we, we, the Jake is an interesting organization because it's, uh, it's, it, you know, we've, we've got a CTO who's a serial entrepreneur and, uh, you know, and, and lots of sort of entrepreneurial experience that, you know, that have come to the Jake because they want to serve, uh, which is, which is a, a story in its own right. But, but um, we made the teams, the students that are going through the training course, uh, develop an AI proposal and pitch it, uh, you know, as, as if they were looking, you know, for an investor for, you know, for, uh, for class A investment, you know, or, you know, or, 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 or whatever, uh, you know, whatever prize that we could come up with. But, but, you know, we made it, uh, we made students work in teams. We made them actually put their money where their mouth is. We actually, you know, uh, assessed them and gave them feedback on their ideas. And it was, it was, it was fun. It was a really good, it was a really good course. And so, uh, so uh, I think we'll, we'll probably stick to stick to that, something like that as we go forward. Right. Look forward to seeing more uh, from that development. As a Marine, leading a unique and flat organization such as Jake, what has surprised you? <laughs> yeah, that's that. That is a really great question, and uh, I, we could talk for an hour on this because it's, I, it, you know, leadership of organizations in the Department of Defense is uh, is a fascinating study in and of itself. I've been fortunate to. to have a very varied uh, uh, experience here, working with lots of different types of units. I, 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 you know, um, I, you know, all of us. You join the military, and you, you know, you, you're 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 trained, and you're you're uh, kind of guided by a hierarchical model, you know, a yep. very industrial age model, right? Built for mass formations and that sort of thing. And so you're, you know, you judge yourself on the commands you get selected for, and you judge yourself on. Uh, uh, you know, how big your command is and how many people are under your thumb or whatever. Um, I, I, I think, you know, after, after a while, you, you, you kind of come to the, you know, a, so a level of maturity when you're thinking about, okay, you know, I'm serving, right? And so what, what is the, you know, what is the nature of my service? Like, how can I serve best? Can I serve best, you know, in, in an environment uh, you know, with large numbers, can I serve best in a, an environment with lots of dollar signs? Because I'm really good at, you know, uh, you know, accounting or what, or whatever, you know, whatever your skill set is. Uh, am I? Do I serve best in, an, you know, in an engineering capacity? And so, like, like this is real, a real important thing for every military officer, right? Is to think through service. What does it mean to you? And and um, and and then if you, you know, if you if you if you think about that. Then, then you, you will, you know, one, you'll be happier, right? Because you'll understand like you, all, of, all, you know, everybody that's on this call you know, has committed their, has committed their professional careers for some period of time, some of us for a really long time, you know, to, 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 to service, right? To service of the nation, to service of the constitution. You, mm -hmm. you never, you can never let that stray too far from your heart, right? Because that's what matters here. It's not the, it's not the organization. It's not the numbers. It's, it's you and it's your service. And so I think it's really important for, uh, you know, for every officer to, to do that introspection. And I, the reason I bring this up is because I think while you're at the War College is a great time to do that, right? Um, sit, sit outside, uh, you know, the, the War College in the, in, the, in the withering wind and, and, you know, think about your service and, and, you know, it will make you stronger in a lot of different ways. Um, so leading tech organizations, is different, right? And if the transformation of the department um, means that we transform some of those industrial age bureaucracies and organizational models, um, we should, nobody should be threatened by that. Leading technical organizations is different, but it's not different, uh, you know, in 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 the, in, a, in a way. So the Jake is um, Jake is uh, an interesting place to work. I I describe it as young, running a unicorn farm. <laughs> so, um, so, and, 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 and I, I say that in the most affectionate terms for any of my uh, uh, Jake, Jakesters who are, who are listening here. Um, the, the Jake is full of uh, fantastic performing individuals, brilliant people uh, who, who largely are doing this because they want to do this. They want to serve. Many of them 
could make a lot more money just going across the street to, you know, Amazon Web Services or somebody else. So, so they're doing it for all the right reasons, right? And they bring, they bring just, just enormous skill sets. And so, uh, you know, for just a plain old Marine like me, you know, this, this, this becomes a challenge, right? Because, or it could become a challenge, right? You just have to think through, you have to lead with both humility and confidence, right? And so in a tech organization, you have to know what you don't know and accept that, right? And, and value the expertise of the people that you have. But you have to lead with confidence too, because your role is to drive the organization to its organizational objectives. And so you can't, you know, that's why you are there. And so you have to have both the humility and confidence as, as you know, as, as, as you go through this. And, and I will tell you, um, unicorns, just like sailors, just like Marines, just like soldiers, they want good leadership, right? They want to be led. And so uh, as a leader, especially, you know, at the grade you're coming out of the war college at, um, uh, you know, your, your people, however many and whoever they are, they will crave good leaders. So, so be one, right? This is, you know, this is a purposeful organization in your mind, and especially while you're at the war college, you know, before you get back to your next job, think about it, you know, commit yourself, be a good leader. That's why you're here. That validates your service. And it's what your sailors, your Marines, your soldiers, your airmen, your guardians will require of you. And so, um, I, you know, I, I, I obviously I'm, I'm fairly passionate about this. I think every military officer should be like, this is the nature of the service. This is why we wear this uniform and we go to places like the War College. So, um, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, you know, it's, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt, the, um, you know, life's greatest reward is to work hard at work worth doing, right? Um, if you're in a tech organization, you're going to work hard. If you're transforming the department or transforming your service, it's work worth doing. So, so I challenge you all do it right and do it with a smile on your face because it's fun if you're doing it right. Okay. Obviously a calling. 